What is going on everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is a channel where I help you break into data science and grow your skills in the field. So this is going to be another video in my R tutorial series and specifically it's the fourth and final video in my series all about using the carrot package for machine learning. So in the last video in this tutorial series, we covered things like how do you interpret confusion matrix output? How do you tune the hyperparameters? So you can do this through using either the tune length or tune grid arguments. And then how do you deal with the class imbalance issue? Because the data set that I'm working here is a 70 to 30 split in the real world. Plenty of data sets are a lot worse than that. So we covered upsampling and downsampling. And the first thing I'm gonna cover here is another method that I think in a lot of cases works really well for dealing with these kinds of problems. So before we get into this, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. And then if you guys would be willing to support my channel, I'll have links in the description of the video to my PayPal account, my Patreon account, and to my crypto wallet addresses. Also, as always, this script will be available on my GitHub repo. So where we left off last time was we had just used upsampling in the training process for our random forest. We created the confusion matrix, and the results from this, well, for downsampling too, are pretty interesting. Because if you remember right from the beginning, we actually had higher accuracy than this, but we had a bigger discrepancy between sensitivity and specificity. It was closer to like a sensitivity of 87% with a specificity that was like in the 20s and 30s. And so in a lot of real world circumstances, I am personally okay with having lower overall accuracy if it means that there's a bit better of a balance between sensitivity and specificity. Again, your case, your individual circumstances might vary, but in a lot of just real world scenarios I've personally run into, if you've got a specificity that's way down in the 20s and 30s, that's really problematic. Now, this one isn't particularly amazing necessarily either, but in my book, this is a massive improvement. Now, we're gonna go over another way that we can kind of uh, correct for the class imbalance issue, and that's gonna be altering the boundaries for classifier thresholds. So when we train a random forest or other classifier, what's going on on the back end is it's assigning every observation a probability of belonging to each of the different classes. So in our example here, when we're working with the German credit data set, there are two classes, remember, there's the bad credit and there's the good credit. Well, if the classifier assigns a probability to an observation of greater than 0.5 of belonging to the bad class, it's going to classify that observation as belonging to the bad class. Now that's a pretty stringent assumption, particularly when we have imbalanced data like this where only 30% of observations belong to the bad class in the first place. So we can tweak this assumption. Instead of a, a 0.5 uh, threshold, we can change the 0.5 to like 0.333, for instance. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's use the predict function. I'm gonna use the RFTL uh, uh, classifier that I created earlier. Now, I didn't do a whole lot of tweaking to this. I just played around with the tune length argument to train. That way, tune length was specified to, I think it was 10 at the time. So there was 10 different values of the M try hyperparameter that I was looking over. Then test set is where our actual data is coming from, and we're going to specify type equals prob here. Now, this fitted prob object here is a data frame. And if we look down here in the console at what this actually looks like, what it's got is for the various observations, there's a probability of belonging to the bad class. For instance, here it's 0.52. Probability of belonging to the good class is 0.48. So this particular observation here was just classified as the bad class. So what we're going to do here is just manually change this. I'm going to create a new uh, object called altered prob. That's just a vector where I'm isolating the bad uh, column from this fitted prob data frame. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to assign this to bad if this probability is greater than 0.333 and to good otherwise. 
So now that we've created that, let's just run the confusion matrix the same way that we would before and let's see how well we did. So we're actually going further down this approach of we're having less accuracy overall, but we're having a better balance between sensitivity and specificity. Now we have a sensitivity of 0.657, specificity is 0.5778, and the positive predictive value is 0.7841. So for these first three things that I look at right off the bat, all of them for the first time uh, in this exercise here are greater than 0.5. So I think that that's good. Now your individual situation will vary. It depends on what the specific uh, measure of success is for you. But once again, for me, the majority of the time, I like taking a decrease overall in accuracy if it means I have a better balance between sensitivity and specificity. But that's just me. So one final related topic that we're going to cover before moving on to the next thing is actually plotting an ROC curve. So with an ROC curve, we're going to have sensitivity on one axis and then one minus specificity on the other axis. So we can see as we change that threshold, kind of like how we just did in that example, how do sensitivity and specificity move? And so we're going to use this ROCR package to do this. There are multiple different ways that you can go about doing this. Particularly, there's, there's one option where you can just uh, use a geom ROC function to just tack this onto a ggplot object. But this ROCR package is one that I've been working with myself for a little while that I happen to like myself. So to set this up, we're going to create two objects. They're going to be called predictions and labels. Now the thing is, this is true of caret functions, it's true of tidy models, and it's true of uh, this next prediction function that we're going to use. They have each different ways of figuring out what's the positive class and what's the negative class. So you may have to just do some trial and error with this a little bit. All of them have their own default ways but it may just be easier to just go about it by trial and error, take a look at the ROC curve that comes out and make sure that it you know, matches reality, because you'll know if you have the, the wrong class specified. But in this case, we're gonna specify the uh, good probabilities here, and we're going to create this pred object based on the prediction function. So we're just creating this prediction uh, object based on the predictions and labels that we've already specified. So it uh, tells us it's a prediction instance with 300 data points. And then basically in the uh, next thing that we're gonna define using this performance function, this is essentially just, just specifying what performance metrics that we actually want to visualize. So if you go to the help documentation for this performance function, it lists out all the different objects you have. It's a very flexible function, but here I'm gonna specify the true positive rate that's sensitivity, and the false positive rate. That's just one minus specificity. So we're going to do that. We're going to basically average over the various thresholds, specify colorize equals true, so we get a pretty uh, set of colors for the graph, and bam, we have our ROC curve. So one thing, you'll know that you specified the wrong class, like here, if I'd specified fitted prob uh, dollar sign bad here, the, this curve would have been under this diagonal line going from uh, zero to one. We see it's above that uh, line here, so that means we have the correct ROC curve here. So there you go, it's good looking. Uh, if you had an absolutely perfect classifier, it would basically be at a right angle, zero going up to one over here and then cutting over here. But uh, because we're not working with academic data, you're uh, probably never gonna see that kind of thing. All right, and now the final thing that we're going to cover in this tutorial series on Carrot is going to be training and resampling and ensembling over multiple models. So in this whole tutorial series thus far, we've only been working with the random forest classifier. Now we're going to recreate one of those, but we're also at the exact same time going to try two different methods. Those are the elastic net, that's specified by, the, by uh, GLM net for the method, 
and we're also going to try support vector machines with a radial kernel. That's specified by the SVM radial method. And we're going to use this caret list functionality from the caret ensemble package. Now there is actually built-in functionality in caret. Uh, for doing this kind of resampling approach, but this carrot ensemble approach is newer, so we're just going to go with that here. So we have to specify the training control up front like we always do, and now for now, don't worry about the tuning length and the tuning grid because we're going to deal with that later. Inside here, it's mostly going to be the same for the resampling method. I'm going to specify repeated cross validation. One thing that is going to be different here is you want to specify something to this index argument. Now, essentially, because we're training multiple different models here, we want to make sure the resampling indices are the same for the random forest as for the elastic net as for the support vector machine methods. And so if I didn't specify anything here for index, Carrot is usually going to be smart enough and figure it out, but you want to be as safe as possible. For here, I'm just going to use this create folds uh, function here to do five-fold repeated cross-validation, and we're going to go from there. So everything else is going to be mostly the same. I'm going to keep to the, uh, I'm going to use the down sampling uh, method that we were discussing earlier because that had fairly reasonable results. And now, in terms of specifying the actual methods to use, there's a couple different approaches, and I'm going to show you both of them. The simpler one is just to specify a method list. That would just be RF for random forest, GLN net for elastic net, and SVM radio, and then you're done. Alternatively, if you want to get a little bit more specific about it and start playing around with the tuning length and the tuning grid, Inside of this caret list function, which is totally analogous to the train function we were using before, to tune list, you can pass to it a named list. So we need uh, named objects inside of it. I'm just keeping it simple, calling them RF, GLN net, and SVM. And then you use this additional caret model uh, spec for specification a function here, specifying that we want to use the for example, RF method with a tuning length of 10, or SVM with, you know, method is SVM radial with a tuning length of 5, however you want to customize it. So, uh, we're going to just keep to the more customized approach here with the, uh, with the tune list instead of letting Carrot figure it out automatically. And then we're going to use this resamples function to see how well we did. We create this ensemble, the caret list function just trains these three different approaches. And then, remember before we specified the two class summary for our summary function, that means we're going to get outputs for ROC, for sensitivity, and for specificity. And we're going to see how well we did. So we got a lot of output from each of the different iterations of these, th of these things running, which is actually only, only five resamples here. Uh, but what we end up with here is you can compare, for instance, the median and mean ROC, and we see uh, the random forest seems to be doing better than the elastic net or the support vector machines. I mean, it's pretty close, but on average, it seems to be doing better. So, uh, yeah, that uh, that tells me a lot when I start moving on from my training data and you know want to actually summarize the results on the testing set. All right, so that concludes this series on machine learning using the caret package. And now, I don't want to say that we just scratched the surface because there were four parts to this uh, to this tutorial, but there's a lot more to the caret package that I haven't even gotten into in this series. So if you read the uh, GitHub documentation written by its author, Max Kuhn, you can go into a lot more greater detail. And hey, if you plan to use the carrot package all the time, I do strongly recommend going through that documentation, at least taking a skim through it and just learning all the different things that you can do using carrot. 
Carrot is not the only way that you can do machine learning uh, in R. There is the newer Tidy Models series of packages, which I'm going to do a series over all that uh, in the near future. Now, at the time I'm recording this particular video anyway, Carrot is significantly more mature, but hey, who knows? That may not be the case several months from now, a couple years from now, so who knows? Okay, though, I can pretty much guarantee if you have a practical use case for machine learning, you're going to find it really easy to easy to do using Carrot. So I'm going to leave you all there. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, consider sharing it. Smash the like button if you haven't already. And then I will see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.